here's the thing. Do you think for a second, like even a half a second, Tucker Carlson would be doing this uh, apologia tour? I know it's 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 a dead horse by this point. Every single time someone brings that up, the double standard that's in place. But like, uh, it's absolutely mind boggling that he's doing this. Like he did a full. And by the way, a friend of the show, Glenn Greenwald, before he came on, uh, yeah, he does a full five minutes where it's like it wasn't really as bad as everyone is making it out to be. You know, is is, is the outrage not worse at the end of the day? Are, are we going to really enable cancel culture? Uh, can we not do this? Glenn Greenwald is an independent journalist in front of the show. You can find his work on Substack, and we hope you will. He just wrote it. That's not something you ever should aspire to be or hear said of you. If, if Tucker Carlson opened up a segment with, like, Lance of the Surfs is a friend of the show, I would vomit on the spot. Like, I would vomit on Tucker. Actually, that's not a bad idea. An amazing piece about an experience that happened to him in early March. Five gunmen stormed a house he was staying at outside Rio de Janeiro. The gunmen held Greenwald in a guard hostage for over an hour. They stuck a gun in his mouth. They broke his security guard's ribs. Glenn Greenwald is the author of Securing Democracy, My Fight for Press Freedom and Justice in Bolsonaro's... Uh, that's fucked up. That's really fucked up. I didn't know that. Brazil, that book is out today. And Glenn Greenwald joins us now. Glenn, it's great to see you. Uh, this was a shocking story. I think everyone who knows you was really stunned to read it. What happened? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I... I, I <laughs> he just goes instantly the resting Tucker face. <laughs> like, so what happened? Like, how, how do you do that? <laughs> I was kind of reluctant to write about it. It happened a month ago. You, When you're a journalist, you don't really want to write about your own problems. But I was really encouraged yeah. to by especially journalists and friends of mine who work on the crime beat who said this is a really good opportunity to convey to people, especially with skyrocketing crime rates in major American cities, about how brutalizing and traumatizing it can be, even if nobody ends up dead. And so I decided to tell the story. It was very similar to what you just said. Um, around nine o'clock at night, I heard my dogs barking incessantly. I went out to see why. And suddenly there were three men all with guns pointed directly at me, ordering me into this room. And when I went in there, they had already detained the security guard of mine who works with me on my security, who's an off-duty police officer. He was laying on the ground and they were standing That's over him with uh, guns pointed at his head. And I was actually very relieved when they began demanding money because my first thought was this could be a politically targeted crime. We get a lot of death threats in Brazil because of my reporting, my husband's work as a congressman. Um, and we didn't have a lot of valuables there. It's just kind of a farm we use on the weekend. And, and um, when I told them that, they didn't believe it. They kind of worked into a rage. And that's when they started becoming more violent, beating my skirt. This is, this is messed up. I didn't know the story. It also makes me wonder, though, if all this went down, why do you have such a concern about cancel culture and SJWs and, like, non-binary people and too many people identifying as trans now? Like, why, why are those the things that you talk about? Because his reporting is seminal, a lot of it, especially the stuff that he was doing on Brazil. It's also kind of weird that it sounds like he's got, he had a place in Brazil with, like, a lot of staff. It, it, it sounds like he... He had quite a bit of staff. I know he's not bringing it up, but like, I, I bet this story could be could be peppered in with a little bit of you know we had to, we had to tell the maids and the manservants to to go into the room into our panic room and uh, they they all got back there and uh, luckily uh, you know we were able to uh, make sure that they were all safe and uh, yeah they went right back to cleaning and serving me directly afterwards. Security guard breaking his ribs, putting the gun in my mouth. They stayed about an hour and then when they finally left, they tied our hands together behind our back, uh, bound our legs together, locked the door and uh, stole the car that, that we had in our driveway. So subsequent, I mean, after this happened, you came on the show and never mentioned it, which I find pretty amazing. So what, I mean, something, an experience like that has got to get you thinking. I'm not sure about what, but what did it get you thinking about? I mean, people change when they go through an, an event like the one you described. Yeah, I mean, the reason I wrote about it is because I actually read about a very similar story of a Vietnamese immigrant fam family in Oakland who had four armed uh, gunmen break into their home at nine o'clock at night when they were putting their seven year old daughter to bed and threatened to shoot the daughter repeatedly and then ransack their house and stole their valuables. And I felt like that story was worse. And I wanted to tell my story to encourage people to donate money to them. So part of it is you just start empathizing with other people who go through it. But you also realize how yeah. fragile life is. You know, it very easily could have ended that day and, and you want to maximize 
the value of each day. And also, you know, you think about social pathologies. What is then the effect of lockdowns and quarantines and isolation and social yes. distancing, not to make excuses for people who do this, but that drive people to this level of desperation? You have got to be fucking me. I like... I started this thinking there's no angle for me in, in terms of criticism without me just coming across as an absolute ghoulish, I don't know, fucking lech if I, if I start saying like, you know, that like that's a harrowing story. That's a very scary story. And what the fuck is he doing with it? Politicizing it like right away. What's like, that's the spin. You went on Tucker Carlson to talk about this really frightening near life death experience where you and your servants were like, you know, put in danger. And then all of a sudden it's like, and that's why I just, I got to bring this up. You know, the lockdowns, uh, they could be driving people to, uh, to commit crime. It's, it's horrible. Well, that's right. I mean, there's gotta be a couple people are clearly getting. Well, that's right. Oh, friend of the show. More fearful. Oh, thanks. I Ruby Knight less solid and grounded psychologically. You, we see it all around us. I'm sure you see it where you are. There's got to be some effect on the broader society of that. Yeah, I mean, there were people who tried warning when everyone was demanding lockdowns in the U.S. and the U.K. and elsewhere, including in Brazil. Look, there are costs, obviously, to the pandemic, but there are huge costs to shutting down the economy, to separating everybody, to locking people in their homes. There's mental health costs. Yeah. There's enormous costs to putting people out of work, to upending people's lives. And it was really kind of a taboo on being able to weigh those costs. And everyone just said, no, the only thing that matters is the coronavirus and stopping it. And I Okay, you did not do a proper lockdown, okay? That, that's one of the problems. The countries that did, like the countries, not, not just the states or the areas or the regions, but the countries that did, such as Vietnam, for example, New Zealand that shut down their borders that locked down effectively you saw their rates plummet and then stabilize at a very low to non-existent level that's what you're supposed to do you've had so many misguided attempts at this where it's like well let's do half measures let's open this up why don't we just do that should we open up the schools we don't know should we open up these jobs we don't know I don't know I, I really want business to continue every single governor is like ah oh, yes open it all and then the other one's like no don't do that we'll all die try this out uh, people can still fly in we can go across states all that like do the numbers not speak for themselves, Glenn? Do, do you not have to just look it up and be like, holy shit, yeah, more people have died here than any other part of the world. I mean, Brazil is catching up. Sure, they had like 4,000 deaths today. But isn't that enough? Like, holy fuck. When, uh, like, Glenn Greenwald is the perfect example of why some people, like, the brush of left, like, I'm a leftist, I'm a progressive, doesn't really make sense when it comes down to it. Because, like... Certain people have all kinds of different beliefs, right? And if you have a couple of them, people are then going to associate you with an entire progressive movement. Whereas, like, you may harbor a lot of conservative ideals as well, as is the case with Glenn Greenwald. That's why people are, like, confused. Like, well, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I, I, I thought he was, like, he's in poll, isn't he? He happens to be a homosexual man. Uh, he's, he's a married man at that. And he's done incredible journalism. And he has. I can't take that away. Yeah, I mean, he's done absolutely seminal investigative journalism when it came to Lula da Silva in Brazil. And and usually when he's concentrating on Central or South America, it's incredible. His anti-imperial uh, stance, awesome, awesome. And then there's all the other shit. And now he's really like merging into, you know, glory be the stonks. Like he's, he's the latest. I think we're going to be dealing with the devastating effects of the solutions to the coronavirus for many, many, many years to come. Did anyone catch the, I should have asked you this. I'm not a very good journalist. Did anyone catch the guys who did this? In my case, uh, they did. They were stupid. They used the car that was in my husband's name, who's a congressman, to try and break into three different stores that same night. They weren't professionals. They got caught easily, um, and the police apprehended them, I'm, I'm happy to say. In the case in Oakland, though, those four men are at large. And if you listen to the seven-year-old girl talk about how she can't sleep because she believes they're going to come back at any moment, you get a sense for how much things like this deprive you of your sense of security. That's right. That's exactly right. Glenn Greenwell, I hope you'll keep writing as much as you can. You become a real force globally. Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe it. So, hey, in the same, like, day-long show, Tucker Carlson also did this segment. Tucker Carlson launches dishonest and passionate defense of the Capitol ins insurrectionists. They didn't have guns, but a lot of them had extremely dangerous ideas. They talked about the Constitution and something called their rights. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Today is the three month anniversary of January 6th. For those of you who- That's wild. That's wild. I can't believe it's only been three months. Who aren't good at dates or don't have calendars. This is the day that we pause to remember the white supremacist QAnon insurrection 
that came so very close to toppling our government and ending this democracy forever. You saw what happened. It was carried live on television every gruesome moment. A mob of older people from unfashionable zip codes somehow made it all the way to Washington, D.C., probably by bus. They wandered freely through the Capitol like it was their building or something. They didn't have guns, but a lot of them had extremely dangerous ideas. They talked about the Constitution and something called their rights. Some of them made political puppy. You'll have to take that up with they insisted, uh, for example, that the media last election was not entirely fair. The whole thing was terrifying. And then, as you've been told so very often, they committed unspeakable acts of violence. By yeah, the time thousands of soldiers arrived to restore order, a an unarmed died. woman, an Air Force veteran, lay dead. Like, don't, isn't that your 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 bread and butter? Is, isn't that like the thin blue line? Cop lives matter, all, all that kind of shit. Like, isn't isn't this supposed to be where the moral outrage should be honed in? You would think. To this day, that woman is the one completely verified casualty of the insurrection. The only person whose death we can say definitively was caused by specific events on January 6th. We know how she died. The funny thing is you almost never hear that woman's name. Possibly that's because she was not a Democratic member of Congress or even a Joe Biden voter. She was a protester. Her name was Ashley Babbitt. She was 35. We still don't know who shot Ashley Babbitt or why. Like, that, that's a huge blatant lie. Are, is Fox News not going to get, get in trouble for that? Is there like, was there a disclaimer I missed at the start where it's like, oh yeah, anything Tucker says could technically not be true. We're not held accountable for anything that comes out of his mouth, including the air. No one will tell us. But then when you're fighting insurrectionists, you don't have to explain yourself. You just hyperventilate about QAnon and then you do whatever you want. When a group of sad, disenfranchised people who've been left out of the modern economy show up at your office, you don't have to listen to their complaints. Not for a second. Why would you? You thought listening to people's complaints was democracy? No, these people threaten democracy. You can even shoot one of them if you want and get away with it. Killing people without explaining yourself is an established part of counterinsurgency. And if you don't believe it, check out what happened in the second world. <laughs> now, here's 12 more segments on why black people are subhuman and why they uh, get killed for reasons that should be explainable. And not a single cop should ever be persecuted for what they do. President Franklin Roosevelt set aside December 7th, 1941 as a day that will live in infamy. Unfortunately, we can now add January 6th, 2021 to that very short list of dates in American history that will live forever in infamy. January 6th was Pearl Harbor, says Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Schumer has never really gotten appropriate credit for the grandeur of that statement, considering the very next day after Pearl Harbor, we entered the Second World War. That war went on for four years. More than 400,000 Americans died. But that was the cost of stopping fascism. We don't yet know the cost of stopping white supremacist QAnon insurrection, but you can be certain that Chuck Schumer is prepared to have you pay whatever it costs. Joe Biden's Justice Department is on the front lines of this new war until late. I like I know he's a, a white supremacist and a fascist. It's it's kind of weird. He's doing this thing, though, where he's positioning himself on the quasi side of the white supremacists and the fascists and saying they're coming for you. Last month, a man called Michael Sherwin worked for the Biden administration as a prosecutor in Washington. Sherwin bragged that his office had rounded up about 400 people who were in or near the Capitol on January 6th. You may be wondering, did 400 people really commit serious crimes that day? Well, that depends how you define crime. Listen to Michael Sherwin's definition. After the 6th, we had an inauguration on the 20th. So I wanted to ensure, and our office wanted to ensure that there was shock and awe that we could charge as many people as possible before the 20th. And it worked because we saw through media posts that people were afraid to come back to DC because they're like, if we go there, we're gonna get charged. We wanted to take out those individuals that essentially were thumbing their noses at the, the public for what they did. Oh, so now it's clear. It wasn't that 400 people broke actual laws. No, their crime, says the federal prosecutor, was, quote, thumbing their noses at the public, meaning the Democrats. OK, I've heard enough from Fashy McFash. Here's the thing. Do you think for a second, like even a half a second, Tucker Carlson would be doing this uh, apologia tour if the insurrectionists were not white? The insurrectionists were like, I know it's, it's, it's a dead horse 
by this point, every single time someone brings that up, the double standard that's in place, but like, uh, it's absolutely mind-boggling that he's doing this. Like, he did a full, and by the way, a friend of the show, Glenn Greenwald, before he came on, uh, yeah, he does a full five minutes where it's like, it wasn't really as bad as everyone is making it out to be, you know? Is, is, is the outrage not worse at the end of the day? Are, are we going to really enable cancel culture? Uh, can we not do this? So, the other day, I made a super cut of Tucker Carlson being a white supremacist. And one of the reasons was, is that not because I wanted to state the obvious, everyone already knows the obvious, that he's a white supremacist, but more to point out the fact that people like Glenn Greenwald and some other people on the left as well, have strangely been fooled by Tucker Carlson because he'll do things like criticize the rich elites or he'll criticize Jeff Bezos. And I mean, that's really someone engaging in populism. He's basically trying to explain to you how there's a separate set of classes and how there's a, a class of the rich 1%. I mean, where have we heard this before? And at the same time, he is fully willing to uphold the racial caste system as well as capitalism itself in any way, shape, or form he can. Because again, he's a white supremacist that wants to uphold white supremacy and don't get it twisted. And it's really weird that people who are as prominent, again, as Glenn Greenwald, will go and say things publicly like, I think he's a socialist. Whereas like, in what way? Like, I know that word has lost a lot of meaning, but still, I don't know a single definition of it in which I would be like, like, just because a person is like rich people exploiting people bad, that doesn't mean like, oh yeah, oh, he's a socialist. I mean, you're kind of just pointing out the obvious, like everyone knows that's bad. Anyways. Highly aggressive campaign by prominent Democrats to denounce us as white supremacists. The first time it happened, the people who Mr. Brain did. Thank you. them kids were shocked and horrified by that. White supremacists? Yeah, national socialists. They plan to try to say what's true until the last day. And the truth is, unregulated mass immigration has badly hurt this country's natural landscape. This country rescued her from a squalid Kenyan refugee camp and made her a national figure, quite an ascent. But Ilhan Omar is not grateful. Who do like this country? We live here. We don't want to destroy it. We have every right to fight to preserve our nation and our heritage and our culture. A war with one side trying to erase all remnants of its opponent, in this case, Western civilization. Is the culture into which they're coming, the Western civilization we're talking about, superior to the culture that the- So if you didn't notice, he almost said the 14 words there. He came pretty damn close. And he's replaced, basically, the words, the white race with Western culture. And that's, make no mistake, that's with intent. Like a lot of people on the alt-right, as well as white nationalists, have been doing that for a while. And it's a really good protection and a barrier against someone claiming that you're racist when you say that kind of thing, because they'll be like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm, this has nothing to do with race. I'm saying Western culture, there's, there's, it's a multi-racial culture. That's one of the benefits of it, okay? We love diversity and it, it, it like, it, we like basically any immigrants that are going to contribute towards our society effectively. That's it, okay? I'm just saying that there's a difference when they come here between their culture and our culture. And are they going to obey the rules of our culture, our hierarchy? The hierarchy of which I want to impose upon them and which I want to be at the top of. Do you think it's possible to move a large Muslim population into the West and successfully integrate them into Western culture? The Congressional Black Caucus exists to blame the white man for everything. Oh. And I'm happy to say that in public because it's true. But what? he knows it's true. You know, white men, you know, they've contributed some, I would say. Like creating civilization and stuff, I think they've done a pretty, I don't know, what else? Iraq is a crappy place filled with a bunch of, you know, yeah. semi-literate, primitive buried, monkeys. This may be a lot of things, this moment we're living through, but it is definitely not about black lives. And remember that when they come for you, and at this rate, they will. Anyone who's ever been subjected to the rage of the mob knows the feeling. It's like being swarmed by hornets. You cannot think clearly. And the temptation is to panic, but you can't panic. You've got to keep your head and tell the truth tell the truth. If you show weakness of any kind, they will crush you. He's, he's showing and he shows that there is massive racism in America against white people, while at the same time saying there's no systematic racism. But people get the message. People get the message all right, Tucker. God damn. God damn. Hey, do you, do you, do you like movies? Do you, do you, like, do you like surfs? Do you want? Do you want? Do you want movies and sur surfs watching the movies? So then come over to the new channels. It's the surfs the cinema. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Can you do the thing? You know that uh, thumbs up and comment and all those things that help us out in the algorithm that controls every aspect of our lives. Also, if you happen to have a Facebook account, um, can you can you delete it? 
Like just just delete it. You should probably delete your Facebook account because it's just it's not a great company. But hey, if you can't do that for whatever reason, I understand. And uh, could you also go to facebook.com slash the surf times then and uh, give us a little like and a follow. We're just trying to push back against the fact that people like Ben Shapiro happen to dominate the platform entirely. And when everyone asks, why do older generations believe the things they believe? One of the problems is the majority of them on social media use Facebook. So to counter that, uh, we're just going to be on there too now. Also, if you happen to have a union or a worker co-op or even a leftist project podcast website, Zoom, MySpace, it doesn't matter. We will advertise it for free on this channel. All you got to do is go to wearesurfs.com and use the forms that we got there, wearesurfs.com. Thanks, everybody. To our gods, I'm Raft and Xander Corvus. We shall build golden idols in your honor. To our monarch, Tom Spiker. Our soft, spongy flesh is yours to command. To our lords, Evan Nudi, Trevor R., Alexander Thaler, Ryan Lubin, Bisexual Black Gamer, Toe Fox, and Jeffrey Lamb, we proudly carry your sigils onto the battlefield. And to our knights of the round table, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, Multimondi, Timothy Hart, Trevor Janis, Lemmy101, Anthropopagic, Saren42, Chronic to Hemphog, Kelly Kotka, The Great Poudini, Von Janney, Catherine, Radical Maniac, Ramon Acosta, Nkosin, J. Fraser Cartwright, Jimmy Big Nuts, Violent Orchard, Sophie Baby, Political Puppy, Andreas Chiringuito, Zach Christensen, Nicholas Marks, Jopi, Josh Mickelson, Melissa Murphy, Todd Buckingham, Todd Lajeunesse, and Constance Joyce Lacheris. We tip our cap and lift our mug and salute you.